to most. Good afternoon to others and good evening to the viewing audience across the pond. I am Jason Miles, your host for another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. If you're new to the channel, please like, subscribe, and if you're enjoying what you see, make sure to hit the notifications bell as we are constantly adding new shows uh, and cross streams to the channel. Just yesterday, I recorded another episode of a new show we're doing called Pop Life with Toy Galaxy's own Dan Larson, where we took a deep dive into the idea of nostalgia. And also for all of those that are new to watching the show, we are also an audio podcast as well. Uh, actually, this show started out as an audio show because I didn't want to plaster this ugly mug all over the net. But alas, things change, and our show is also available still on audio podcast apple podcast spotify soundcloud and wherever else you get your podcasts and i have to mention and i can't forget that october 23rd we'll be doing our first ever live show in conjunction with give them an argument with ben burgess and left reckoning give them a revolution live show october 23rd in los angeles california at the Terragram ballroom Myself, Deep State Cuba, uh, who else is going to be there? Of course, Ben Burgess, Matt and David of Left Reckoning. Uh, who else? Derek Varn is going to be there with Daniel Bessner. A whole crazy cast of characters. It will be fun and enjoyable. There's still tickets left. Wherever you are watching or listening to this show, even later, there are links in the description. There's also links in the chat for tickets to the show and VIP tickets are still available. That being said, let's bring in the Saturday crew and we have almost a full crew in the house. Jean Bajlan sadly couldn't make it, but I have my homie, my dog, the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He's back. The Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. Hello, hello. I I came back from my run and I showered and I'm still super hot. And these lights coming at me are not helping. That's gonna so do it. If I look like a pastor right now, all that kojic energy is coming right back yeah, at you. All of it's coming right back. We're gonna bring Spencer all the way back to the south. Yes, sir. <laughs> you want to talk about Fanana? <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, rich of the earth <laughs> and the white man <laughs> that keeps us in chains <laughs> hi <laughs> i don't think anyone saw that one coming and that's okay that's okay uh also i want to uh bring in the producer the headless faceless voice of reason the deepest breather she is in tucson hello i may be a bit congested but oh. i am here you know i was i was congested as well coming back from uh from cuba's homeland and uh uh i was we're just gonna blame it on cuba for congesting us even though you weren't there we're gonna say it's it's Cuba's white supremacy that's got us congested. Hi. Were there more like him at home? Cubas or white people? Okay. Because he's from Canada. Got it. Got it. So plenty more. Like <laughs> uh, there's one other. There's a Cubet. There's a Cubet. Um, he has a, a older sister, who is a lovely woman. Um, met her and her fiance. I uh, actually look forward to hanging out with them again. Um, nice. That you know, let's stop talking about the gentleman like he's not here. <laughs> he is the newly minted, married. I think he's one of the few married middle managers on the Death Star. Um, he is our favorite uh, stormtrooper HR. 
representative. Deep State Kuba. Everyone, um, I thought that my intro line was going to be uh, the white man that keeps us in chains. Um, but that was also good. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Already and, disappointed. And for the record, um, there was another Kuba at the wedding. There you was. I met, I met the other Kuba. Super European Cuba. The, um, yeah, he's he's like um, um, my older brother in emigration, but my younger brother in um, time spent on the earth. Um, he came over as um, uh, after high school to study, and we got introduced because somebody somebody's mind got blown that there were two Cubas at the same party. And the name. What's funny is the name isn't even like that uncommon. No, it's not, but <laughs> mind blowing. Mind blowing. The um we also had two Mishas. Um, <gasps> really? Yeah, so uh, Is there a Pasha thrown in? <laughs> well Gene, right? Uh, Gene is uh, Pasha of the uh, late Ottoman Empire. Um, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should have gotten in gotten him into the Kuba Misha uh, group picture. Um, um Pasha. so Kuba Kuba two. Or, or clone Cuba um, has has children, and to entertain the children in a house full of adults, and to entertain the adults, put on Karate Kid, right? Okay. And uh, the kids were entertained. Us adults also entertained. Uh, Nostalgia. But, uh, Heck of a drug. It is. You'd be surprised how many people love the nostalgia. You'd be surprised how many people love the crap. <laughs> <laughs> um, at one point, one of the the littler the littler little Kubas, uh, you know, pulled one of the funny little kid moves where you're a parent at a party and you don't want to grab your kid by his shirt and say, "Look, kid, I'm gonna fuck you up." And so he was trying to be cool about it, and so the little boy had to leave with no pants on. That's the funniest shit ever, because that man was trying to keep it together. <laughs> While his son left the party, just bing bonged out. <laughs> Felt so bad for that poor man, because he was the only one that kept his kids there the whole time. So Kuba too, good dad, good dad. Let's give it up for Kuba too. All the dads that go to adult parties with their children and don't take them into a quiet room to yell at them when they melt down. That is. You're the real one, piece. Or oh, beat them with shoes. I think he wanted to. Shoes. <laughs> to, to be fair, um, you kind of get that vibe from other Kuba like a lot of the time. You know, the um, there's a list of people. The kids aren't even at the top. <laughs> I saw that. Shit. I saw that poor man, and I was like, "Hey, brother, I've been there. I already know." Don't worry, you got about two more years of this. Um, I do want to do a Wood Street follow up real quick. Um, there is a bike ride that some of the people uh, from Wood Street are doing. Did you see that, Tucson? Uh no, no. That's I will, very cool, though. They're doing a bike ride from the Bay to L.A to build solidarity with the unhoused community down south in Los Angeles and also to raise money for some projects they're trying to do uh, in the Bay Area, uh, get some money to get uh, some businesses together, uh, get a food truck that actually is a food desert down there. There really isn't any place to eat anymore because uh, during COVID, the one diner that we had down there that closed at 2 p.m. Uh, closed down. So, uh, if, if uh, Toussaint puts that up, the link up for that, we're going to have those guys on probably in the next few weeks to talk about what they're doing down there uh, in the nice. Bay Area. So, shout out to the Wood Street community. And thank you, Armando, for keeping me um, abreast of the situation that's going on out there. I don't live there anymore, so it's hard to get news about it. 
Now on to the show, which is a show that we've been looking forward to for a while. We booked this show a while back. Um, about a year ago, uh, we did a show on Fanon with Peter Hudis. Pascal, do you remember that? That was a great show. And today, our guest kind of wants to challenge not so much that show, because we talked about Fanon as a whole. And in this, we're going to talk more about Fanon's work, The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, our guest today, Spencer Leonard, and for our and also our former colleague at Sublation Magazine, uh, is going to talk with us about a recent talk he gave at the Gandhi Center on the Martitian professor Franz Fanon. Spencer taking his PhD in South Anguish, Anguish, Asian languages and civilizations and history from the University of Chicago in 2010. Spencer Leonard is a co-organizer of the conference together with Shah Mahmoud Hanifi. He's currently working on an edited volume of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels' writing on Bonapartism and imperialism, and another book entitled Adam Smith in Calcutta. The second of these grows out of Leonard's research on the East India Company's conquest of Bengal and the resultant Enlightenment critique of company empire on the company empire as nothing less than the precipitating cause of the crisis of the British Revolution and thus of the Enlightenment itself. I should get you guys ready for what we're going to talk about. The level. Please welcome my friend, Spencer Leonard. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Um, and thanks for sending us your, your uh, this, I guess, the speech notes from your, from your talk you recently gave. How was that talk? It was fine. Um, you know, there's this thing that they don't know what to do with called the Mahatma Gandhi Center for something or other at James Madison University. And it used to be headed by an Indian who steered it into like basically a Hindutva think tank. Mm -hmm. And as Gandhi got, always the, intended. <laughs> as Gandhi intended, um, you know, that's a deep question. Um, leave it aside. And now they've turned it into some sort of, you know, a, yet another, you know, Democratic Party hand wringing center. Um, and so I just went in there and said what I said, and nobody asked any questions. <laughs> well, we okay. Well, we will be the audience that you were trying to speak to, and I do want to um, bring up something you re you mentioned early on in your in your speech. Um, <clears throat> you, this is a quote from your your uh, speech. It wasn't just a Holocaust for Jews. In short, from a less perspective, fascism and World War II meant the decimation of what had been for decades the epicenter of the international socialist movement. The other assumption that is no longer widely recognized respecting the 20, 20th century fate of the socialist revolution that Fanon was familiar with, but is less well known today, is the idea that socialism conspired in its own defeat, indeed defeated itself. This is d done <clears throat> through its accommodation of capitalism, whether in the form of revisionism embraced by social democracy or through the Stalinization of international communism. Fanon came to political consciousness as a soldier in the European, European theater of World War II. The political failure of the European left was everywhere and unmistakably evident in 1945, even as the communists claimed victory over fascism. Fanon had fought as a volunteer in the Free French Army, and it was World War II and the defeat of the left that fundamentally conditioned mid-century decolonization movements. And it was these movements that, of course, came to dominate his concerns. In that period, the old impulse of especially pre-World War I colonized intellectuals to hang their hopes on the march of European socialism no longer sufficed. At the same time, as again, Fanon well understood, decolonization was won through the struggles of millions in the colonized world, originally at the time of the Comintern's drafting of the national and colonial theses in 1920. The idea had been that the anti-colonial revolution would complement and be complemented by the ongoing European revolution. After 1945, the modern revolution was dead in the industrial core of world capitalism, yet 
national liberation struggles raged in the colonial periphery. In this sense, then, the wretched of the earth is a kind of meditation on progress within an overarching process of historical decay and regression. Now, Spencer, was this, in your opinion, a kind of end of history moment for Fanon? Um, it was, yeah, in a sense, it was. Um, the, I don't, the, I'm getting a lot of noise, but um, World War Two. I mean, I kind of, I, I guess I'd, I'd say that I kind of uh, simplified things there mm -hmm. uh, in, in what I wrote. I mean, really the coming to power of fascism and the self-defeat of the left are not two separate processes. They're really one in the same process, um, which is to say that, you know, the left, if you will, allowed fascism to come to power. Mm. And, and, you know, the, fa the failure to prevent that was, as it were, the definitive signal that the European left was in terminal crisis. And what I'm trying to point out there is that in 1945, so, so Fanon was a very, very young man, it mm -hmm. should be said, when he, he went to fight in Europe uh, for, for the free French, you know, for the liberation of France um, in the free French forces. And, you know, in that sense, he's taking part, you know, the, there's the idea that, you know, perhaps was, you know, was plausible uh, that World War II would end in revolution in the way that World War I had. But that wasn't really the case. Uh, instead, it ended in ruin. And in that sense, the full force of the significance of the rise of fascism uh, in Europe was perhaps more evident in, in 1945. Um, yeah, there certainly was a moment of at least liberalization or mm -hmm. something uh there was a there was a question of there was a kind of a presentiment of the possibility of a potential for some left resurgence mm -hmm. oh i and think spencer froze the, there you, are, go. Can you hear me now we can you froze for a second what was that there uh, was a, a left insurgence this is the last thing we heard yeah i'm i'm seeing here that um I'm, I'm going to just switch over to a different channel on my Wi-Fi. Okay. While well, Spencer's stuck in the uh, no-go zone from Johnny Mnemonic. Um, <laughs> he's, he's in the internet. Like, remember that movie, Kuba, where it, you know, like when you had to go online, you had to go in the internet? That's where yeah, the um, literally in the internet. I I remember um, like '90s vintage cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. um, th I think the finest one may have been um, Disclosure because um, it appropriately situated the um, like key interface as being dealing with HR bureaucracies by um, you know paranoid middle aged. Um, C-suite leaders that um, are getting accused of sexual harassment. Um, but but sorry, I think that Spencer's he's, back. He's, he's back. Yeah. He's back. And someone yes. lives in a busy city. Here we go. Yeah, sorry about that. I, no I really problem. have no idea. I have no, no idea what that was about. Uh, you know, this Wi-Fi, I guess, cycles every 24 hours. It goes and you know, decides if it really wants to do this. Um, so what I was trying to say is that, you know, World War II is, a, is certainly a crisis for, for the left. It 
the left failed to avert it, which was a world historic crisis, undoubtedly. Um, it meant the decimation, as I say in that quote that you that you so kindly read, Jason. It meant the decimation of what had been the epicenter of the left. It doesn't mean that um, there wasn't a left in North America. There was, and a lot of hopes hinged on that left. And you can see those hopes uh, expressed in Black Skin, White Masks, um, Fanon's first book. Um, which he wrote in, in 1952, where he's looking to, especially the black struggle in the United States as more advanced um, and of course, ongoing. But in that sense, you know, I mean, you know, cards on the table, I'm giving you a, a very Trotskyist reading of the history of the left. Um, you know, I'm, I'm criticizing the Stalinists for celebrating the defeat of fascism as revolutionary. Uh, you know, no one wants to deny that fascism needed to be defeated, uh, but it, in and through the rise of fascism, the, the fundamental specter that haunted Stalinism was exercised, which is the prospect of the renewal of the revolution in the core of capitalism. Um, that was the ache that, you know, the left was experiencing throughout the 20s and 30s, going back to the failure of the German Revolution. And the end of the German Revolution and really the entire European Revolution, which the German Revolution would have signaled, uh, is something from which we've really not recovered and all you know so what i'm trying to to say you know and this really gets to my criticism of, of peter hudas and and of other readers of fenon is that you know they read him positively uh which is to say they read him as affirming the course of history um that you know the way you get this is you know that the struggle continues, that, you know, Fanon is more relevant than ever, et cetera. Whereas I'm trying to read Fanon as a critic of the failure of the left and by extension, a critic of the third world or decolonization revolution as a symptom of that failure, right? That um, decolonization, you know, who can disagree with it, right? Mm -hmm. who, who can wish that it is otherwise? Uh, but it what, what celebrating decolonization amounts to is the idea that the struggle of the left just persists. World War II is a kind of hiccup or you know, really nowadays, you know, the pre post World War II world is just, you know, beyond redemption. And all that exists is the post World War II world because it's anti racist. You know, we really get this, you know, it, it's about the struggle of, of, of the colonized and marginalized peoples. And the world before that is some horrible Eurocentric world. And what that effaces is that the struggle in the 1950s and 60s for Fanon is what it is now, which is the struggle for world socialism. And to ignore that what that requires is a reconstitution of the struggle for socialism in the core of capitalism it's basically to affirm capitalism. You know, you're, you're, you're talking about, um, you know, I mean, for instance, um, Peter talked about, you know, the revolutions in, you know, that, that Fanon was looking to push 
the third world revolution, you know, beyond the bourgeois democratic stage. That's not going to be possible apart from its participation in a broader socialist revolution. And Fanon is very aware of that. Fanon treats the third world revolution as conditioned by historical regression. His entire argument about violence stems from that. And his, the whole argument is about how the third world revolution in its own terms can only produce neo-colonialism. That the question of going beyond neo-colonialism is a question of the third world revolution somehow reigniting a wider revolutionary project about which of course he is both hopeful and agnostic so he has all these statements you know we have to leave europe behind right we have to bid farewell to europe the european dialectic is you know stat is static uh of course he's right about that um you know, history has failed in his lifetime in a fundamental way. And he doesn't know how to reboot it except to say, let's critique the process and the struggle within which we're participating. So he, in a sense, accepts the Third World Revolution as the ground of his thought and then tries to criticize it from within to by basically bringing to bear uh, a, a critical consciousness of the conditions of it in the conditions of the third world revolution are the failure of, of socialism or what i just called the failure of history ask him well i i uh i i find i i really wanted to address uh, some of those points particularly and I'm glad you were transparent in your admission that that was a kind of Trotskyist analysis of the history of the left during the World War II era. Mm -hmm. But I think that to say that the project of Fanon was to bring forth a socialist revolution is to erase the fact that a large portion of, of Fanon's theorization is rooted in trying to reconcile the failures of blackness as a political operating principle in the face of the ensuing post-colonial world. And it, it becomes easy to reduce Fanon to simply saying he's a socialist when part of Fanon's argument is that the French socialists aren't worth a damn because they're not going to fight for the Algerians. If you read Wretched of the Earth, Fanon constantly talks about the trap, the trap of African intellectuals being enamored with Western thought. Indeed. And is that a negative? No, I mean, that's, that is in a sense, the point, right? Is that he's talking about the failure of the left, right? He's saying this is a self-betrayed left, right? Whether you're talking about the, the French communist party, or you're talking about the French socialists. Um, the French socialists, you know, more directly uh, participated in the the actual uh, subjugation or attempted subjugation of the Algerian Revolution. Uh, but the the communists were tepid. They certainly didn't support uh, the demand for independence, which obviously Fanon does. Um, you know, in that sense, he's taking the um, extreme position of decolonization as the necessary project of the post-war period. Uh, but, you know, I think if you, you know, I'm not quite sure about the beginning of your question, uh, Pascal, and I, I want to make sure that I address it. Um, you know, there's no doubt, I agree with the second part that, you know, I, I would simply say that, you know, I read that as commensurate with um, his, you know, 
you could call it ultra leftism. I would call it orthodox Marxism, right? I don't think it's, you know, I think that he's, you know, criticizing the left that exists. He's criticizing existing social democracy and the existing communist movement. I think and, that, I think but, that, but you were saying something just, if I may, you were saying something about like the failure to, of, like to confront blackness or to work through blackness. I don't know what you said. What, I repeat think that, that when you look at his evolution from black skins, white masks to wretched of the earth, yes. there's an evolution. It's clear that there's an evolution there. In black skins, white masks, he is dealing with the consequences of black identity in a Western colonial uh, engagement and the psychological consequences of that in that world. But part of uh, one of my critiques of that work is that it engages in excessive amounts of racial essentialism in terms of the assessments that he makes. But when you get to Wretched of the Earth, he evolves away from that essentialism and basically realizes that this is a struggle. And I agree with you that, there, that this is a material struggle in which the Marxist analysis is important, but it cannot be neglected that there's a particular way in which the material realities of the globe in this post-colonial moment, for colonial moment, if you will, interface with race and demand something simply more than just socialism. And that new thing has to be a new form of humanism. I agree with you that Fanon critiques liberal, the liberal democratic order. And I would argue that he's a more of a, more than just a critic of the left. I would argue that he's a cr critic of all of the liberal. He, he finds the liberal democratic argument to be a farce in and of itself. And uh, a, a hypocrisy, if you will. Uh, I'd, just I'd like to... Reality. Uh, I'd like to just um, offer something, um, something a, a little different, um, because the conversation about the the failure of the left, failure of um, decolonization, um, reminds me a lot of some of the discussions that uh, I was having around the failure of the American project in Iraq or Afghanistan, and um, where you have great political programs or great geopolitical realignments uh, envisioned, uh, envisioned, there's always the question of what happens if you don't get to your outcome. Um, for instance, world revolution requires so many contingent um, factors, so many places where it could, can go wrong. What's your fallback position if it doesn't pan out? And the in a lot of ways, we go back to the late 19th century and the uh, interwar period as high watermarks of the political agency of the left, especially in Europe. Um, decolonization and third worldism is kind of the, the moment of agency of the left in uh, um, the global south. But in each case, the maximal leftist program, global socialism, um, is unattainable with the resources available. Um, now we're in a world where the left is a shadow of what it was like um, either in the core or in the global south. And if that's the position you're in, if you have so limited agency, such limited resources, um, while the liberal uh, global markets uh, elites are still incumbent and still control existing legacy institutions while, and mass mobilization is stronger in the hands of the far right and reactionary forces than, uh, than in the left. Is there a second best outcome? Is there a way that if the, the left is doomed to fail, can we fail better? in um, using the limited resources that we have to achieve something which might uh, be an improvement over the status quo ante, something that may set us up for um, future mobilization, 
create conditions for um, for a systemic breakthrough, or are we just consigned to um, like living in the ashes of our project while groups like um, ethno-nationalists in Ukraine and Russia, the sort of TradCon International, uh, as well as the um, remnants of the, the 90s neoliberal elite um, go on about attempting their own projects for um, for world systems and uh, political programs. Um, so I guess that's my question. Can we, that's if Fanon is pointing out the failures of the West, can we fail better? It's a very question. Especially, I want to I interject because I don't want you, I don't want you to mix mischaracterize what I'm saying. I agree with you in that Fanon is critiquing the, 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 the liberal, everything left of the, of, of the conservatives is basically up for grabs with Fanon and is basically viewed as fraught with internal contradiction and failure based on its adherence to basic humanism. And I agree with you that, that he makes that critique. I just wanted to emphasize, I didn't want to diminish the fact that he starts from a point that it is the racial subjugation of Black identity that starts this inquiry with him. But he evolves beyond that when he comes to a point where he realizes that is still important to the question, but it is part of a material form of subjugation that still must be reckoned with, but that particular aspect of that racial materiality cannot be denied in its significance. So I think that to just simply reduce Fanon to a, theor a theorizer on the need for socialism, the diminishes his, quite frankly, not to be a race, race reductionist, his black revolutionary capa capacity and importance. Because what makes Fanon an important black revolutionary for me is that he kind of is trying to get beyond simply the racial element of black revolution, the need for black revolution, and tries mm -hmm. to get to a point where we need, to, we need to have a human revolution. Okay, you guys, you've got to let me answer here. Yeah, you, please. You've, you're, you've put so much on the table, and I'm not, you know, I'm sure that we're going to spend most of uh, the next however much time, you know, you guys just going to be repeating these questions because I'm not going to possibly answer everything uh, here. But, um, you know, what I would say is that in in response uh, to Pascal, is that the the question of 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 racial equality and of and of geopolitical subjugation, anarchy, inequality, i.e., global imperialism, understood as a colonial order. Uh, I think imperialism is not just a colonial order. I think it's a metropolitan state order as well. Uh, it has to do with the rise of uh, the militarization of the, the state, the concentration of power within the executive, uh, the crisis of, of representative government within the metropole as well. And you guys can read my forthcoming volumes on, on Marx's analysis of imperialism and Bonapartism to, to find out all about that, uh, those connections, uh, the, the question of, if you will, Bonapartism in the core and global imperialism. What I, but to the, the point is, is that the question of, of, of race and especially, um, you know, as a North American question, and global empire, which of course gets reposed in the post-war period as the American question of race. Uh, and I think, you know, new world, um, new world slavery and Jim Crow, that that question is concentrated in the United States as a political question. Uh, you know, that comes to as it were, fuse with the question of American-led neocolonialism. 
in the post-World War II era, right? Now, what I want to say is that these questions are, first of all, I strongly disagree uh, that Fanon is a prophet of a new humanism in the sense of some other humanism, right? Fanon understands, in my view, that the Enlightenment already grasps that human differences are products of history and society in a fundamental way. Fanon was a student of the Enlightenment from an early age, and he quotes, you know, at crucial passages, at crucial points in Black Skin, White Masks, for instance, Hegel and Kant. And I don't think that he thinks that Hegel and Kant are racists, or as Peter Huda says, that it's somehow white, or Eurocentric. I don't think he thinks that at all. He claims the legacy of the modern revolution, of modern bourgeois thought, and understands that that legacy, which of course was anti-slavery and anti-racist, in the American Revolution, in the French Revolution, in the renewal of the French Revolution in 1848, which abolished slavery in Martinique and in the empire, and in the renewal of the American Revolution in the Civil War. Over and over again, this question of the reassertion of the bourgeois revolution, both in its, as it were, bourgeois revolutionary moment and in its crisis phase after 1848, is taking up the question of the universal emancipation of man. And I, I think that he's, as I say, very aware of that. And the problem is, is that the fate of that liberalism, of that, of, of that enlightenment legacy is carried by the project of socialism. Socialism deliberately inherits it, claims it, right? Marx, Engels, but really the entire socialist tradition, right? They found the socialist interna the second international on the 100th anniversary of the French Revolution. That's deliberate, right, in, in 1889. And it's not as though intellectuals in the colonial world are unaware of this, right? Intellectuals in the colonial world before 1917 when, yes, the revolution becomes global, right? At the common turn, we see the entire world arriving, right? In 1919, 1920, 21, 22, right? It, the, the, the face, if you will, of the leadership of the socialist revolution and the actual development of organizations uh, around the world, in China, in Indonesia, in India, uh, in Vietnam, ultimately in the Arab world and in Africa. Of course, there is a global communist movement that I would say participates in the crisis of, the, of global communism after um, the failure of the German Revolution. But before that, there were intellectuals in the Middle East. I know very well from India. It's one of the nice things about being a scholar of South Asia is that you can see a highly literate uh, intellectual class experience colonialism over a century, almost a century and a half before the outbreak of World War I, they were, you know, these people were not naive and they were not simply collaborators, right? They understood what Fanon still understands, which is that the fate of the modern revolution, the fate of Africa, 
the fate of South Asia, the fate of Southeast Asia, etc., is bound up with the rise of the proletariat in the industrial core. And that that carries with it, as if you will, and this you know will might sound a little provocative, the promise of colonialism. The promise of colonialism is the creation of a global emancipated society. The realization of, if you will, 1498 is the creation of a global humanity. And socialism inherits that project, right? It isn't just a project of, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, that um, Fanon's critique, for instance, of negritude is that as that project is collapsing in Europe, the question of black identity mm -hmm. is, if you will, replicating the prevailing regression, right? So as you guys talked about with Peter, um, Senghor says that, you know, the, the Negro is emotional as the European or the white man is rational. And that is obviously a, a, a racist statement that's sort of affirmed. Right? It's a quotation of Gobineau, who's an arch reactionary of the era of 1848. And I think that Fanon is saying that in this sense, negritude has the potential to reproduce the collapse of the revolution in the you know the collapse of the task of 1848 the collapse of the task of global socialism right and this is why he you know very deliberately in black skin white masks asserts his humanity asserts that you know he is not going to be confined to his blackness right and of course, that white people who are, you know, he t talks about the double narcissism, right? That the question of, of, of you know, the re-emergence, you know, there's a re-emergence of the question of race with the failure of socialism. That's how I read that book, as an analysis of the situation in 1952, mm -hmm. right? Is that, look, race is reasserting itself. There's a breakdown of sociality. We're blocked in our double narcissism. You know, you you know, you and your blackness, you and your whiteness, right? And he's saying no, right? I refuse to be anything less than a man, and I inherit the entire project of modern emancipation, right? It's a, I mean, for people who haven't read that book, they yeah, should read it. It is an it is an incredible book. You know, obviously we are talking about an immense towering intellectual in Franz Fennel, right? Absolutely precocious, right? Writes that book at 27. Um, you know, in, in, in his works are not easy. And, you know, I agree that they sustain all kinds of interpretations. But, you know, I think that for him, um, in some ways, I don't necessarily think that the wretch of the earth is like an advance or an evolution I'm trying to rescue it from what a lot of people, you know, of a lot, a lot of my friends, for instance, when we used to teach this at the University of Chicago, we used to teach Fanon and, you know, uh, friends of mine and I would always argue, if we're going to teach Fanon, we have to teach black skin, white masks. And I still think that's a, it's, it's a really important book for undergraduates, um, you know, to, who are, you know, who just assume that like, Black people are different and white people are different and like they have rhythm and like, you know, all, you know, I mean, young people are like, like racist again, like even if they, they're racist and they're anti-racism. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the question of Wretched of the Earth that I'm, you know, the, people would say, oh, Wretched of the Earth, he's like capitulating. Friends of mine have certainly made this argument. Uh, you can, for instance, read uh, Sunit Singh's uh, wonderful 
uh, review of the new translation of Black Skin, White Masks, in which he makes this. It's in the Platypus Review. Um, great article. But he says, oh, well, uh, Wretched of the Earth is, um, you know, it's a capitulation to sort of black nationalism, third worldism. And he kind of quotes Eldridge Cleaver, you know, who says, you know, every brother on the rooftop can, can quote Fanon. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that, you know, the reception of Fanon has been overwhelmingly the reception of the Wretched of the Earth. And I'm trying to rescue it from that reception and to say, well, he's acknowledging, in a sense, the further degeneration of the global situation, or if you will, its turning point. And this, I think, you know, Kuba, I can't begin to get, you know, to talk about like the present Except, except to say that, you know, what I'm trying to say about Fanon is that he was the eminent dialectical critic or the negative dialectical critic of the Third World Revolution. And that that revolution, you know, yeah, it's a post-war thing, you know, but he really takes it up, you know, and I think it's interesting to talk about why he does it as an African thing, right? He scarcely ever talks about the decolonization of Asia, mm -hmm. um, which, the, uh, you know, I wanted but, to, but if sorry. I just, to, just to finish the thought, you know, one of the things that I point out in my lecture is that, um, that anti-imperialism, the affirmation of decolonization was one-sided it became a way for the Western left to avoid the task, which I think is a very deep problem, of rebooting mass working class, a mass working class movement for socialism in the core of capitalism, right? The $20 million question, right? How is that going to happen, right? Um, I think that question was posed circa 1956. I think it's what we mean by the new left, right? Uh, what we mean by the new left is that the task of creating a new left was glimpsed. And it was bound up with race, right? Because the single biggest trigger of the global new left is not Khrushchev's 20th Party Congress speech. The single biggest trigger is civil rights in the United States, mm. right? Civil rights in the United States is an immensely s significant world event. And because it meant that the fundamental political pillar of the post-war world, namely the Democratic Party in the United States, was in crisis. Right. That's what civil rights means. Right. It means that the Dixiecrats are getting kicked out of that party. And therefore, there's a real political crisis. And I think that, you know, by certainly the end of the 1970s. Right. It's clear that there is no new left, that the new left failed to create a new left and that its affirmation of decolonization it results in the uncritical affirmation of decolonization results in the complete degeneration of decolonization right so that even the anti-colonial movement what does it look like it looks like the iranian revolution mm. right it's it's right wing Right. It's openly right wing. And so um, to Cuba's question, you know, I'm not making an all or nothing argument about um, world revolution. Right. It's not that like a revolution succeeds or fails. Right. From, you know, the question is, are you building strength in and through defeat? 
right? As Rosa Luxemburg says, you know, all is not lost so long as we haven't lost the ability to learn from our defeats, right? In fact, it's it's in and through political struggle and defeat that the proletarian revolution develops. It's its only, as it were, school, right? How do you learn what capitalism is? You don't learn it by theorizing about value or, you know, Marxist categories, right? You learn it in and through trying to overcome it and trying to lead the discontent that it itself is generating beyond a capitalist, as it were, uh, reconstitution of itself. If, right? if I may. Yeah, so in the, what, what Stalinism means is not like an authoritarian movement or Russian domination or whatever. What it means is liquidation of historical consciousness. And the way that you do that is by calling defeat victory. You can't learn anything from a defeat if you call it victory. And that's why I, you know, that's why I said, as soon as the, you know, it, the, the most relevant form of that as far as this like as far as what i'm saying about fanon is concerned is the stalinist claiming that they defeated fascism in 1945 as part of the upward and onward development of global communism that's a lie right that is calling a defeat victory and that is a liquidation of historical consciousness of what had happened since the crisis of the revolution in 1917 to 19. The revolution and its crisis in that period that's that's the beginning of my answer to your question there uh, okay let me um follow up on on some thoughts because you, you gave us a lot there and um i'll be reacting to bits and pieces that might have come and gone 10 minutes ago um one point that uh, i wanted to return to was the idea of a, a human revolution uh, as opposed to uh, anti-colonial or uh, a white revolution, a black revolution. Um, and it, it made me think that the fundamental lie of colonialism, um, most explicit in the French formulation of the mission civilisatrice, is that the colonizer is rational. The colonial subject, the colonized, is irrational and the colonial process, colonization, imperialism, are going to be the school of rationality for the wretched of the earth outside the, the light of French enlightenment, um, which is, of course, an ideological justification for um, conquest and plunder. The lie of decolonization is that the colonizer is... Um, perhaps irrational because of their uh, deep-rooted racism or commitment to the imperial order or um, other ideological motivations, or perhaps rational, but in that extremely exploitative way, that they're lying about their goals, not about their, um, uh, not about their um, capacity. And the anti-colonial movement is the rational one. And that's where a lot of the sort of left anti-colonial fusionism comes from, uh, a kind of Marxist template combined with um, local anti-colonial indigenous um, empowerment. And I think that eventually we get to the point where neither side is rational, right? The, you have... Um, some material drives of particular groups within societies, of particular individuals sometimes, that then get interpreted through the ideological frameworks that are available and are often uncommensurate with one another, um, uncommensurable with one another, which is where you arrive um, with Franz Fanon to 
this will be settled by force. Because if both sides are unable to um, communicate and deal with each other's rational agents and try to find uh, a living arrangement which can reduce um, potential loss and suffering, then you'll only force can settle the question. Another point that you made, Spencer, is that the fate of uh, colonial peoples is uh, closely tied to the proletarian revolution in the core of the industrialized world. And I think that um, from a strictly material and um, coercive perspective, unless you have the core, it's going to be very difficult to get any ambitious project off the ground in the periphery, because the core will always be there to either deprive you of the economic oxygen you need to survive, to manipulate the international system against you, and in extremis to um, intervene directly. And the real threat to the core is not decolonization, but its own internal um, leftist uh, movements and prim primarily based on uh, working class mobilization. Well, if you're, you said that leftists um, learn by defeat, then we should be the smartest people out there. But um, I got to give some credit to oh, you, the you, you, liberal you. motherfuckers because if they read Marx, and they're like, yeah, this proletariat is a threat. Let's just deport them all to China, not by sending the people, but if you eliminate the industrial jobs, which are the basis of working class mobilizations, um, the union structures in which um, you have that dual function of providing practical benefits to working class people and also increasing uh, political consciousness, providing a, an institutional vehicle for mobilization. If you can just banish all of that, then the people can stay, but they're going to, um, they're no longer going to be proletarians. They're going to be a much more easy to manage and a much more desperate and a much more self-destructive um, kind of mass underclass. If that's the case, then um, the countries that we really should be looking at are the ones which have retained enough of an industrial working class base to potentially produce that kind of uh, movement in the core. China, Japan, um, industrializing Asia, and Europe look a lot better than the US and the UK in this case, simply because they still have uh, unions, they still have um, working class consciousness, um, and the material foundations for some kind of leftist mobilization en masse through the working class rather than um, a hodgepodge of identitarian groups largely steered by um, co-opted liberals from um, the PMC. So um, I guess those are the two points that I, I wanted to flag. Like one, what do you do in a condition where you might not have the you know, you have to go to war with that. You have to go to revolution with the proletariat you have, not the proletariat you would want to have. And maybe the proletariat you need is somewhere else. Um, and the second is... Uh, oh, you, got, you can't ask anything more. Okay. <laughs> That's a there. lot. Uh, especially if Pascal's going to ask anything. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted, Sorry. One of, come one, back of the, to me. one of the places that I see a major agreement I have with you is in... What I, and I, I and I, sadly I think wretched of the earth contributes to this phenomenon is the development of third world fetishism that takes up in the left during the late sixties early seventies period that causes many leftists who are frustrated with the rise of neoliberalism and the pivot away from the kind of Bretton Woods standard to to indulge in this kind of almost kind of like watching what's going on in you know in, in Malaysia and all of these other third world places because they can't organize the working class in their own country and that reality still exists amongst a large segment of the left 
I'm not saying that we shouldn't be internationalists. Of course we should be internationalists. But many of these comrades are completely uninterested in dissecting the way in which capital is dealing with labor or the lumpen proletariat in the industrial core. And what you've seen, Pascal, is that the millennials who were so frustrated, you know, in that sense, I think that a lot of millennials would agree, right? Their, their sort of foundational experience was the anti-Iraq war. And they just said, you know, I, I can't deal with like the world's problems, right? I'm just going to talk about Bernie Sanders and universal health care here in the United States, right? We can't like, so in a sense, what's happened is that, um, you know, the, in response to, um, you know, the, the kind of empty cosplay, you know, solidarity of an older generation, the younger people don't even, you know, they don't know anything. I mean, it used to be like, you know, when uh, you and I were younger becoming leftists, that to become a leftist was to get an education in the, what's going on in the whole world, right? And to learn about movements and parties, et cetera, and histories from all over the world. That's obviously, you know, how I became a South Asianist, um, you know, was as in some way out of that impulse. And I, you know, with with young people, it's just like, you know, very, as it were, national, and you can get this sort of patriotic socialism and all this stuff. Um, so there's a crisis around internationalism, whether it takes the form of third world solidarity, or it takes the form of a kind of, you know, self liquidating preoccupation with the domestic political situation. Um, now, Cuba, I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I can't quote exactly what you said with respect to the problem with decolonization, but I, I simply want to say that when we read Wretched of the Earth, what you get from Fanon is these very insightful analyses of the trajectory and dynamics of the anti-imperialist revolution, which are, you know, he's primarily a student of the Algerian war for independence, uh, but he's also a student of all of the decolonizing movements in Africa. And, you know, whether you're talking about, uh, you know, of course, Ghana or Kenya or Senegal or Angola or all of the movements that were uh, Congo that were afoot in his day, he's a very astute observer. And what you get in The Wretched of the Earth is a kind of distillation and kind of phenomenology of the anti-imperialist revolution, where, which is very confusing for a lot of readers, right? Because... Um, he is voicing the perspectives from within, right? And what I'm trying to get people to understand is that Fanon is very self-conscious and he signals it in key moments in the text that, look, when I'm voicing the dynamics of these revolutions. I'm not simply affirming them. I'm asking how might they point beyond themselves, right? And, and so, you know, in their own terms, he never identifies the programmatic route to the success of the Third World Revolution. Nowhere in that book does he say, this is how this is going to succeed, 
mm-hmm. right? This is the class that's going to lead it, right? He'll say the peasants are going to lead it. They're the most revolutionary class. And then he'll say, well, actually, the lumpen proletariat is the most revolutionary class. And then he'll say the, the proletariat is a crucial, it will play this crucial role in the revolution. And then he'll say, you know, the peasantry are not going to lead this revolution to the end. And the lumpen proletariat are exactly what Marx said they were. You know, they are, you know, whatever, um, you know, the... Um, the scum of society they're going to you know they're 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 going to be the supporter of of you know any dictator who tries to hijack the revolution and the proletariat are entirely you know they're entirely compromised by their links to the metropolitan bankrupt leftist parties and it, you read it and you're like what is this guy saying mm-hmm. right because it, you know, he's exploring. You know, he, it's it's a this relentless in in many kind of multifaceted. Each chapter, I think, is almost like a take um, mm. of the contradictions of this revolutionary movement, right? And you know, that's what I want people to see is that you know, it, it Fanon, you could say it's like liberal in the way that we all must be liberal, right? We have to accept our time. The movements here, the potentials now, where do they point, right? And what Fanon is saying is, well, you know, the potential here and now is conditioned. It's regressive. People are violent. It's driven by resentment, right? He even quotes the Bible, right? He's a good student of Nietzsche. He knows exactly what he's saying when he says, the watchword of the revolution is the first shall be last and the last shall be first, right? He's saying, you know, this is going to be a big, messy, democratic movement that's driven by resentment and discontent. And mistrust and ethnic divisions and even when you think that the national movement is dissolving those ethnic divisions it's giving rise to a new form of ethnic nationalism right it's not starting you know it, it's liberal in the sense that it's starting from like where we are at the same time it knows that we're not starting de novo we're not just starting from like you know, pre-capitalist conditions or something like that, right? It's not enough to just say that the colonial world is pre-capitalist, right? Or semi-feudal or something like that, that it has gotten this far, but no further in some sort of, you know, march of progress, some kind of Stalinized conception of, you know, everyone is somewhere along the stage, you know, some stage along the path to, to socialism, to the inevitable destiny of man. No, these are situations that are highly regressed. Just like in the core, there's a diff- that regression looks different, right? The regression is there around the world because the global revolution is in collapse. And that means the actual disintegration of social relations, right? And so it's a kind of, as I say, it's a it's a negative critique of the dynamics of the revolution to see how they can begin to turn the situation that we find ourselves in into how can we turn these liabilities into assets. And of course, the most fundamental uh, fact of the post World War II world is that any revolution to succeed is going to be straight, you know, in, in, in a sense, inevitably and straightforwardly a world revolution, right? Um, just as an aside, this question of learning from defeat is not like a question of like learning your lesson by being like a historian and like seeing defeat in history, right? It really has to do with um, 
the party form and the role that a socialist party plays. And so, you know, another, you know, I could say that Stalinism is like the liquidation of historical consciousness, but of course there are organizational dimensions to that, right? To the liquidation of the party form as such. Um, you know, as to like, what is the core of capitalism? I agree that we really kind of don't know. Um, you know, I don't agree that there's historical consciousness somewhere or that there's a proletariat somewhere or that there's socialism somewhere, just not in America and Britain. I think that that's, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't think that that socialism is any less liquidated, um, you know, elsewhere in the world than it is in the United States or in Britain. Um, I think that um, the question of, you know, we all know the crisis of, of American global hegemony. Uh, but I think that... Um, it is still very likely the case. I mean, there would have to be a major revolution within China for China to be to lead a global revolution. I think, you know, ultimately, um, of course, you know, no one nation is going to lead. Um, you know, there we need to think about the reconstitution of international socialism. But I would strongly push back against any notion that the most, you know, I, I, I would say to the American left, building a socialism in the United States would be an immediately globally significant event. It would transform geopolitics radically, immediately. Right? It, would it, would it would change the Israel-Palestine Israel Israel-Palestine conflict. It would change the situation in the Ukraine. If there was a party for socialism in the United States that was rooted in millions of working class people and that wasn't simply a capitalist party seeking to administer capitalism mm -hmm. like the Democratic Party, but was in some way an inheritor of the American Socialist Party an inheritor of the second international that would be an event of world historic significance it would change it would change it would be a hearth and home issue in sub-saharan africa yeah. it would be a it would be a hearth and home issue in south asia right there's no underestimating the significance of rebuilding socialism in the place that still produces the culture of the world that is still the center of the global film industry, the, of the global culture industry, of global education, of global intellectualism, right? To think that there's no, like, you know, that, you know, that uh, I, I don't think that, um, you know, we really know like what, you know, of course, um, you know, the United States may turn out to be a completely and irredeemably, you know, irredeemably counter-revolutionary force in the world. You know, who knows? Uh, but I don't think that, um, I don't think, in the, you know, because there hasn't been a revolution, you know, one of the things I basically try to say is that nothing has happened in the world since the failure of socialism. Yes, sorry, Jason. And, and you point the failure of socialism to be the post-World War II. Oh, I think it's the, you know, it's World War II is cashing it out, mm -hmm. right? Hitler is the, as it were, um, the, the executor of the estate mm -hmm. <laughs> after, after the death of socialism, right? Um, he, you know, he, he makes it clear mm -hmm. 
by sending them to death camps that the socialists are, that socialism is dead in Europe. And you right? say he, you mean you're, you're speaking Hitler, of Hitler yeah. fascism, right? Mussolini um, style. Yeah. In the U S you know, or Britain, socialism is, is completely subordinated to capitalist politics. Yes. Um, you know, but not physically exterminated. Uh, and, and so this is my final question is, uh, and thank you, Spencer, so much for, for taking some time to, to talk with us today. And I don't say my mm -hmm. final question, our final question, that'll probably lead to 24 more questions. Uh, Pascal <laughs> and I wrote uh, six questions. I don't think we asked one of them. Maybe we got mm -hmm. kind of into one. I asked the first one and then, you know, went off the rails. Cuba always has. Why don't you just ask all of them and I'll pick which one I want to It's answer. too late. <laughs> too late. You know, you wanted to be this the smart guy. This is a great guy. conversation, though. I'll tell you right you now, this is a great guy. conversation. Um, but in all seriousness, I do want to end with this. Um, you talk a lot about uh, the new left in your work in general. You know, there's definitely a lot of conversations you have with people that are in the SDS, were in the SDS, and even the, uh, the weather underground. Um, and do you see, like, what do you see as the failure of the quote unquote new left? We talk about it here on this show um, actually quite often, uh, the 60s in general in this moment, because I think this moment through the, through the, misty watercolored vision of nostalgia some people look at it as some sort of great moment of a left how do you view the new left in the 60s spencer and i'll take my answer off of you. um i mean that is haunting this question you know of fanon because fanon i mean i would say that fanon is really an american writer his reception is overwhelmingly American. Um, and, you know, but he's certainly a new left writer. He's a global new left figure. And what I'm trying to suggest is that um, the critical dimensions of Fanon are liquidated in and through his reception and there that in a sense we have to scrub away uh that reception to get back to it the most fundamental failure i would say of the new left is its self-monumentalization that we you know and again um as my generational cohort you know, Pascal will know this very well. We grew up in the shadow of the new left in a fundamental way in, in the 19, you know, coming of age in the 1980s and 90s. And the problem with the new left is that they never acknowledged that they failed. What they told you was all about their success, right? Bravo, bravo. Right. So they told you that they, you know, that, that everything was terrible before they came along and they ended racism and they ended sexism. And, you know, nobody wants to live in a racist or a sexist world. Even, you know, nobody could live in the past. You know, that's certainly true. Um, but the point is, is that in capitalism, progress is the form that the reconstitution of capitalism takes, right? That progress is the, is the way in which society regresses. It's capitalism 3.0 as opposed to 2.0, right? Now with 10% less racism. And with um, even less of a sense amongst young people, certainly amongst my generation, uh, that there was any task left unfulfilled beyond their task pushed. So, you know, there's no end to anti-racism, right? There's no end to the struggle against patriarchy. The world begins 
from this point of view, you know, in 1968. And, you know, I would argue that anti-racism, and this is my fundamental criticism of Peter Hudas, you know, he says Fanon is more relevant than ever because look at Black Lives Matter, right? It's the biggest movement in the history of America. He doesn't tell you that this is just to get, you know, it, this is to put a new and really very dark face on capitalism. That electing the Democrats, which I would say is what the Black Lives Matter demonstrations of, of 2020 were about, plainly, unmistakably, they were conditioned by the coming presidential election. And they are... You know, and in that sense, there's like a, it's like a repetition compulsion. There's no way to think about leftist politics beyond just this endless, you know, we are not overcoming Jim Crow. This isn't the new Jim Crow. This is a new world. It's very hard to understand what it is because we don't have a left to clarify it. But I'm pretty sure that Jim Crow's over. And... You know, but the left isn't comfortable when you say that. When, you know, I, I know, Pascal, you pushed back on this when, when Peter started to say this. You know, like, well, Fanon is relevant because look at mass incarceration. And you and, 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 and Jason both, I thought, very rightly pushed back hard on that. Um, because he, you know, essentially was liquidating the socialist horizons of Fanon into the capitalist horizons of the Democratic Party. And so I think that the problem with the new left is that it never ended, right? It, it, never, it never won or lost, right? It's just this thing, you know, the 60s that you're supposed to be like super nostalgic for or something. You know, the point is, is that they tried... All of them, Bayard Rustin, Martin Luther King, like people that we think of as very mainstream, were actually interested in socialism and in new party political forms. They were interested in strategies to develop that. Of course, people farther left were interested in that including even Michael Harrington, the godfather of the DSA, that will not talk about it, right? Will not talk about, you know, the, the failure of the strategy of entering the, you know, the 2.0, you know, um, strategy of splitting the Democratic Party, right? Which they're taking their model from the 60s. Now, I will say that the... The repetition compulsion, you know, runs very deep. And in America, you know, there's also, you know, the, the repetition of the 1960s, which at its deepest core, you know, looks to the civil rights movement. Because the civil rights movement was by far and away the most, you know, laden with potential political potential. Um, that itself points back to the U.S. Civil War. Right? It points back to the way that, you know, our Constitution, our, our Bonapartist state, our legal order is really a fundamental product of the last revolution. And that last revolution in the United States, of course, is the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I think that that creates a lot of confusion around this race issue, et cetera. And you can kind of see it in the way that people allied the question of Jim Crow and slavery, et cetera. Um, yeah. So when you talk about 1968 and the failure of the new left, one observation that I'd like to make is um, 
there's a fundamental tension within um, capitalist liberal democratic societies between um, solidarity with a collective struggle and the opportunity for individual advancement. And what you had with the 1968 generation moving into the 1970s is um, a great deal of youthful enthusiasm on the part of um, young college educated people who generally had a lot of resources and who generally were white um, for the notion of collective advancement, universal advancement, uh, emancipation of um, particularly disenfranchised or marginalized groups, mm -hmm. which lasted until a lot of them started pushing 30 and realized that for them it, themselves individually, the door was open for individual ascent within uh, a system that remained hierarchical and unequal. And one way of one function or one happy outcome for that particular group of monumentalizing the 1968 new left is that it gives you ideological leave to put aside collective struggle and organization for the sake of your individual advancement. And that is a, uh, that is a strength of this variant or, of- Or you could just leave it to capitalism, right? Capitalism could complete your revolution, which is, I think, what neoliberalism is, uh, and right? Is it that's, Go ahead, sorry. That's, that's how you square the circle, right? The, um, many people are um, fundamentally uncomfortable with cognitive dissonance, that you live your life, you earn your rent one way, doing one thing, um, but you're values, your inner life, your social world point in a completely different direction. So you have two sets of clothes, two sets of slogans, two sets of values, two sets of ideas. A lot of people can't handle that. Um, and they seek some kind of reconciliation. And the whole 90s, the internet will save us, liberation through technology, um, Apple as emancipator, uh, provided an ideological template where you could square those circles um, and get away with having your career while still looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, uh, I'm, I'm a good leftist that cares about um, minorities and gays in Nicaragua. Um, I think the film, and, that, the film that typifies this the best, for those who remember, is The Big Chill. Mm. Say more? I, how so? It's been a while since I watched it. The Big Chill is a movie about literally 60s hippies who are growing up in the 80s after one of their friends committed suicide and how they're reconciling all the, the left liberal politics they had in the 60s with their kind of reactionary posturing and careers and aspirationalism that they start to take up in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Right. Sorry to Bother You actually also has... Um, that a contemporary take on um, that forced, right, that decision point um, where you, capitalism is willing to reward talent if it's put to profitable purposes for a capitalist. And the tantalizing offer of, um, advancement, comfort, affluence, power, status is always available for um, people who are willing to walk away from the left. Um, and it's a challenge because many people on the left also, you're here because um, if you're working class or if you've been frozen out of existing systems of patronage and privilege, honestly, a steady income, some status, sounds kind of nice. Um, and- Absolutely necessary. Absolutely necessary for survival um, by itself. And um, 
one of the challenges that we have in this bombed out, hollowed out, no party structure, deinstitutionalized podcast internet left is how do we, with scant resources to even keep people, uh, even keep, if you pardon the expression, cadres doing this full time, then how are we going to help members? How do we, um, if we can't help ourselves? And I'm not proposing any kind of solution. Um, that's not really my role. I'm more a black pill depressive guy. Um, but that is a challenge that um, organizing the left will need to, to manage or overcome. Right. So, um, in a way, you know, I mean, I, I think that, you know, neoliberalism is the, the capitalism that the new left built. Um, ooh, ooh. you know, I, it's, I would, it's painful. you know, that, you know, again, like if we think of capitalism as politically constituted and it is politically constituted, it is not just some economic system. And then there's a politics, right? It requires to be reconstituted as a state and political order. And it's only resources for that, as I said before, were the di are the discontents that it itself generates. And the discontent that mid-century capitalism, Fordist capitalism produced is the new left. And, you know, I, I, you know I, just to say one more thing about the new left, you know, I what I'm trying to tell people, the young people who I hope listen to this, is that you, you have to go through the new left, right? They tower over us because they actually much more deliberately attempted to address the historical crisis than the millennials did. And so the way that we think about the history of the left, the way that we think about Karl Marx, the way that we think about Hegel, the way that we think about Fennel, it's all shaped by those intellectuals of the 60s and 70s. If you see a book on Marx from 72 and you see a book on Marx from 2022, read the one from 72. It's going to be better, except for mine. Um, almost, in, you know, and that's, very generally the case you can learn a lot from that leftist generation but their ideas their revolution exhausted itself into neoliberalism neoliberalism brought we have you know there's no denying it tens of millions hundreds of millions of people of color of women into the labor market or to, into sectors of the labor market where they had never been well represented before, right? It's not just that like it was an attack on unions, an attack on the working class and a counter-revolution. The attack on unions that we think about in connection with Reagan and Thatcher was connected to the overcoming of racism and of sexism. There's no doubt about it. Right. The, that's where the left and neoliberalism are dovetailing. Right. The the work, organized working class couldn't manage its own growth and survival and development as a force in the absorption of the, you know, the massive abs abs absorption into the labor force that. American society, for instance, witnessed in the 1970s and 80s and beyond. Now, what I'm trying to, you know, what's hovering over this conversation is that neoliberalism is now like, like, you know, way down the road of crisis, right? Way down the road of crisis. It, we have difficulty designating 
what post neoliberalism is because it's so hard to see ourselves in the creation of history right so it just feels like a kind of a unfolding of the crisis of neoliberalism that the that society scarcely participates in or certainly that the left scarcely participates in um and in that sense the world it's very hard to recognize like what we're entering into but you know we do know that you know things like trump the crisis of the political of the party political system you know trump and sanders in 2016 you know are clearly you know late late expressions or late symptoms of a deeper social crisis that's been going on for at least since the 2008 financial crisis but i would argue even before that um you know so we live in a very opaque world and you know what i think it's important for us to do um cuba is you know i think that we look in you know the young people or maybe you know i don't know how old you are i guess you're probably a millennial uh, I, I think that, you know, Cuba and I are in, are in our 40s. I see. Right. So what we're looking at with like 35 year olds, like it is, you know, really the millennials as a whole. And I think that uh, the younger people are participating in it, uh, you know, Gen Z or Zoomers. It's a lot of cynicism and demoralization and depoliticization. And, you know, obviously our powers are poor and limited. Uh, but, you know, to the extent that, you know, what we're trying to do is educate young people who presumably listen, um, you know, is I, I think giving them like a critical, you know, a, a critical historically informed take on like, look, this is what we're going through. Rather than telling them, you know, a Sunday school story about how, you know, we're, the lion is lying down with the lamb and everything's, you know, you know, Biden's in power and, you know, soon we're going to build back better. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of young people in the last 20 years, you know, at, at least for a moment, like they, they heard that call, you know, that dreadful call of freedom mm -hmm. in themselves, right? Which doesn't make you happy. It doesn't have to make you unhappy and it doesn't have to make you poor and it doesn't have to make you live a life without love or friends. And sometimes people use leftism as an excuse to be unhappy and it doesn't have to be, it shouldn't be, right? We make friends we we find lovers all all the rest you know maybe through our leftist activity or or other means um but you that call to of freedom is just something you can't shake once you've heard it in in my experience right the question does come like you know okay like i i want to be good to my friends and i want to help my mother and i want to help my wife and i want to help my brother you know, but at the end of the day, what am I contributing to the achievement of world socialism is a question that's posed itself for me. Right. And I think that, you know, as a, you know, whatever degenerate, uh, you know, sort of proletarianized intellectual, whatever we are, um, you know, it is our first obligation not to lie to the young, right? And to try to try to help them to gain as much clarity, which I think is the only way to stop them from you know, to, from suppressing that sense that they had, that invitation to the left, that invitation to addressing the tasks of history that they felt 
over the last gener you know over the last two decades in a way that is clearly coming to an end right and so you know i think it has to be you know they have to you you have to channel it into like a life of thinking and the life of honest you know fanon is a great he's a great teacher because he so clearly combines like book learning education and he's a voracious reader and he stays up at night you know he does reading everything he can get his hands on but he's a student of life and he's learning from his experience and from his relationships right and in and and that's something that you know i think at this stage when it it's very unclear, like, when is, like, the left going to show signs of life again? I don't know. It looks very grim, right? But it, it will. It has to, you know, this society breeds discontent. And what are these young people who are going to be in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s and be in the position to mentor and teach what are they going to draw from their experience, right? Just to say a word about it, one of the things I was so upset about with Sublation Magazine is that I saw that as an opportunity of guiding people's education in a time of depoliticization and demoralization, hmm. right? You think we're in a time yeah. of depoliticization? Really? Oh, for sure. For sure. I, I, I think it's going to get worse after the midterm. Uh, I think to the extent that things are political, they're completely farcically political, I right? Because it's, it's just about Democrats in 2022, right? I mean, obviously, this Biden election has been darker than I ever thought it could be, you know, like the FBI, the CIA, you know, American, you know, it's just it's we're talking about nuclear war. Right. We're talking about, you know, going to nuclear war with like a woke anti-racist military, right? With a lot of trans people, right? It's it's like it's so dystopian and Orwellian, right? That it's like mind boggling. And and I think that um, you know, a lot of people are just checking out. You know, they're, they're looking for satisfactions in private life, which are, you know, they're always there. And, and I, you know, as I think Kuba was suggesting, you know, you have to find those. Um, you know, it's not just two hats that we wear. You know, I don't talk to my mother like I talk to my wife, like I talk to my friend. Right? We, we, mm -hmm. we, we got many slogans and mm -hmm. many relationships. Right. But there's also the one of like, what am I in history mm. right and i think you know there it, it it has to be like a very stark project of you know no lies and you know no bullshit affirmation so you do know? you think we're, we're returning to a kind of 90s uh moment of i think we're so hyper political that we're almost anti-political to kind of to to what you were saying a kind of angry apathy yeah. an angry apathy that's going to keep people kind of mm -hmm. disengaged but, i like that but the the thing about engagement in this moment of kayfabe is what are you engaged with other than just political theater and that's just right. not real politics so i think that might be why people quote unquote check out i think there's probably going to be a lower turnout in 2022 and 2024 um and... which could be a sign of intelligence <laughs> it, it could it could be a sign of politicization right well uh, the there's one question is uh something like the q anon movement is that politicization or depoliticization because on the one hand it's operating with a, a logic that's divorced from any underlying political reality it has no realistic program and largely is a validation and entertainment mechanism for the people that um, engage in it. 
then again, the political consequences are severe. So maybe they are we're now. entering. Yeah, maybe we're That's entering true. a. a uh, a phase of uh, politics by proxy, and mm. I would prefer to go to do that with the South Korean proxies, which are boy band fandoms, and um, instead of the weird patriotic cosplayer cults that spring up across the U.S. Well, on so, that note, I'm sorry. If I could just say one, you know, what I'm trying to say about Fennel is that he's looking at a kind of cosplay, right? He's looking at a kind of pseudo-revolution, right? That's what the... He understands that the Third World Revolution isn't coherent in its own terms, right? That that it doesn't, you know, that for all of its intensity and all of the intensity with which he throws himself into it, he's also completely historically self-aware of its limitations because he understands what's conditioning it from within. All right. And I think that, you know, that's what we can learn from Fennel. Like, rather than, like, a lesson, like, this is the lesson about the Third World Revolution, or this is the lesson about racism, right? What I, the lesson that I want to highlight with Fanon is, what does it mean to try to think through revolutionary politics after the failure of revolutionary politics, mm. right? What does it mean to try to think through, like, you know, the trans revolution and you know let's call it let's let's be very generous and call it an equality revolution right i, I really don't know that that's what anti-racism is about but it's what i hope it's about uh, you know let's think about the struggles of our time and the the, the needs of our time and no they're not coherent on their own terms no, every identifiable dynamic that we can see, none of them lead to the goal. There is no clear program, right? This is what I'm. This is what I am trying to get out of Fennel's Wretched of the Earth. Is that sense of like you're totally engaged, and yet you're not capitulating to the present. Right. You're not just, you know, an activist. Right. You're not just engaged in pseudo activity. Right. You're not engaged in activity, in leftist activity as a way of liquidating your consciousness. But rather you go into it with that consciousness, right, that you throw yourself into your own time and it struggles because what else do we have? Right. We, you know. And I think we still live in capitalism. And I think the in innermost potential of, you know, I think that's a very hopeful statement, right? If we live in capitalism, there's a possibility of socialism. Because that's what capitalism is, is the deferred potential for socialism, right? The blocked potential for socialism. And so I think that, um, you know, Fanon is a, is a teacher in, you know, uh, it, in maintaining historical consciousness as in, uh, you know, as you participate within the potential in the left of your own time. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Pascal Robert, do you have any uh, parting words for this conversation? Uh, I actually enjoyed the conversation a great deal. I felt that the, the, the discussion about Fanon was at a caliber that I have rarely seen in online spaces, regardless of the disagreements. And I found uh, Spencer's position quite elucidating. And, you know, I, he definitely made me reconsider some of my positions and thoughts. And uh, I also liked the Cuba's additions and questions as well. And um, it was overall very insightful. I'll be very honest with you. That was my, my opinion. Cuba? The, I was 
I mean, France Fanon, uh, as Spencer pointed out, is heavily assigned in uh, American colleges and universities. And I had that book on my syllabus as a student and as a teacher um, more times than I can easily remember. But today, this was a, a new take, something I hadn't heard and something very enriching. And I think that the questions that we open up are important ones, unfortunately, ones without any clear or comfortable answers. But um, it's the, how do we take the insights and start building that program or at least give the tools for younger people to start putting the program uh, together in, in the context that they have to live under. That's, that's where we have to go to next. But um, this was um, very illustrative about where not to go. Toussaint, do you have any parting words? No, I just felt this was a very rich, rich discussion. It's a pleasure to listen to, and it will be a pleasure to re-listen to. Well, thank you guys for checking out the show. Spencer, thank you very much for taking some time to, to talk to us. We really appreciate that. I'm sure there will be dissenting opinions leave them in the they're comments. already saying in the chat that pascal is too generous with me oh well people <laughs> think pascal is some sort of black nationalist because he yelled one time <laughs> I, I really i think you know the the uh the parasocial what are you gonna do about it what are you gonna do about it that's what i say merch and live tickets so Don't thank forget. you guys for for having me on. No, Spencer, really, thank you, and thank you for sending us the uh, the talk uh, that you gave. Uh, I definitely Anytime. took several notes from it. And next time you come on, maybe we'll stay a little more to the format, and we'll send you the questions beforehand. Uh, I'm really glad you're not one of those uh, academic guys that makes us send you the questions a week before. <laughs> It has to go through two layers of legal review. <laughs> because this conversation took, I, I would say, Pascal, you probably would agree with me, took a little bit of a turn from the it question that stayed in line. And that's how this is supposed to work. So thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed what you saw, please share the show with your friends. Again, if you have any disagreements, agreements, comments, leave them in the comments. And Kuba will return them all. Unopened. <laughs> <laughs> or MP, are you going to return all the comments? Um, I'll put emojis in some of them. Well, that's my thing. Is it? Oh, yeah. Passive aggressive. But you do passive aggressive do. smiley faces. I do do passive aggressive smiley faces. Mm. And on that note, passive aggressive smiley face. <laughs>